the FBI or any of these other agencies aren't going to be very um, intense when it comes to how people are using Bitcoin. And if they're using it the wrong way, um, you know, you have a lot of these establishment actors partnering up with groups like Chain Analysis, which I believe was funded by NQTEL, the CIA. Um, you know, they have a very vested interest in that. And then you have former CIA directors like Mitchell Morrill, who now um, works for Beacon uh, Global Strategies, um, you know, putting out pieces on 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 Bitcoin and, and things like that, saying that, you know, it would be preferable if uh, criminals used Bitcoin instead of $100 cash bills yeah. and stuff. So, you know, they definitely think they're going to be successfully able to uh, surveil people. Um, and again, it they will be if regular Bitcoiners or developers do nothing to prevent that. And I think there's an effort sort of to make people think, oh, look, here we are, we've arrived, we've won, and sort yeah. of get people to uh, sit back and relax and do nothing. In today's interview, Whitney Webb is going to be giving a ton of shocking revelations in the cryptocurrency space and how there are the CIA and the FBI currently funding a number of different crypto-based companies in order to do their bidding for them. You see, generally speaking, the CIA doesn't go and read through blockchain transactions on their own. Instead, they fund a company and appoint people within that company to do the research for them. I mean, the end result is virtually the same. The CIA is getting a ton of information on you and virtually everybody else on the blockchain, but the people that are funding it, <laughs> you know, CIA, a little bit of a conflict of interest there, considering they're supposed to be a public serving agency, but now they're spying on us. How did that happen? Well, we're going to find out in today's video. And also, we're going to be diving deep into the world of stable coins and why November specifically is going to be an absolutely insane month that you all need to prepare for. Smash that like button so everyone sees this video. Let's get into it. The obvious that uh, it's the conservative camp really only aside from you know rfk being an independent uh, they're interested in really appealing to uh the bitcoin base at all as it as it relates to electoral politics and they've done so um very successfully but i think again um it, what you're seeing here is sort of what we saw uh over the course of the past year was sort of wall street warming up to bitcoin um and what we're seeing that it, it's just another extension of the establishment cozying up to bitcoin i guess so I guess you could frame, uh, you know, Larry Fink's about face uh, and and all of that um, as sort of the private sector establishment turnaround. And this is sort of the public sector establishment turnaround. Um, but as far as it relates to financial freedom, I don't think the policies um, expressed by, uh, you know, Trump or at least what Trump expressed or hinted at in his speech, because he didn't, you know, as far as RFKs went, he was more deliberate about what his policies specific yeah. um and trump was a little more vague but based on what you know trump said talking about sort of yoking bitcoin and the dollar together and using that to expand the dollar's power and hegemony globally and then also bringing in stable coins which of course would be in this case dollar denominated stable coins into the play uh, we have to uh, consider what that means if the reason we're voting for it is to ensure that bitcoin will be used to propagate financial freedom globally so, you know, if you're of the opinion that you want uh, Bitcoin to be, you know, hyper Bitcoinization to come at all costs, even if that means it not being a tool for financial freedom anymore, or it being used by intelligence agencies to surveil people or uh, by Wall Street to, you know, do do their thing, um, you know, then maybe it's fine. But if you're of the idea that, you know, I want uh, Bitcoin to be empowered to um end ir irresponsible fiscal policy mm -hmm. at the national level and want it to ensure financial freedom for everybody then i don't think trump's policies necessarily st uh, spell that out unfortunately um and part of that has to do with the whole stable coin play um so trump has been very openly um against central bank digital currencies but the problem with stable coins uh, particularly the big ones um is that they're just as programmable and surveillable as cbdc's could be so most people are against cbdc's because of the programmability aspect and how we and the surveillability aspect being able to trace and surveil every dollar you spend um and you know stable coins can offer that as well because most of them are uh you know built uh, they're like erc20 uh, tokens right at the end of the day and have that programmability functionality and some, you know, stable coin issuers that are prominent like Circle uh, openly talk about the programmability aspects of their stable coin. 
And, you know, they're in a very uh, deep uh, alliance with BlackRock Circle, particularly. And Tether itself um, has made an alliance with the FBI and the Secret Service and, you know, other aspects of the U.S. government to freeze wallets at the behest of the U.S. government, thereby making Tether uh, sort of a, a soft extension of, of U.S. foreign and fiscal policy abroad as it relates to sanctions and other things. Uh, some of which the U.S., of course, in the past has used to facilitate regime change operations and other things, not necessarily stop terrorism, um, as they are inclined to say. So I think for a number of different reasons, it's really important for us to understand the difference between CBDCs and stablecoins. I think there are certain stablecoins that do exist today that, frankly, are very decentralized and fantastic options. But generally speaking, they're always under the scrutiny of the U.S. government because of the fact that they are used using the US dollar. So the US government essentially uses that as a Trojan horse to get involved and start monitoring and even accessing certain parts of that stablecoin that they really should not have access to. And frankly speaking, I do think that stablecoins are going to be an integral part of our future, but it's really important that we all ensure that they're not abused in a crazy way like CBDCs are planning to be abused. Now also another thing when it comes to decentralization and Bitcoin specifically, WinnyWeb gives a ton of really important points about that and how exactly Bitcoin itself is actually very centralized right now due to the mining and who has the majority of those miners. And so this is probably something that we need to tackle as well. And I think that's really crucial for all of us to understand. So I want you guys to listen closely to what Wendy Webb says here for it's going to make a big impact on cryptocurrency in the future. Yeah, well, I think a lot of people don't think about the infrastructure play of it, but it's held in, in very few hands. And there's a very small group of people that run, you know, most of the dominant uh, services we use and the infrastructure we use. I mean, most of the internet itself, I think, is, you know, uh, the essential infrastructure of it is like 13 servers around the world. World. Um, and it's actually a lot more fragile uh, than people think and also a lot more centralized than than people think. And there's a lot of ways um, where they could um, implement unprecedented censorship of people, whether that's, you know, financially or speech wise, um, if they wanted to. And so there are a lot of um, uh, ad agendas as it relates to being able to use the infrastructure at all going forward. Um, I think we've talked about before sort of the effort to um, force people to adopt some sort of biometric digital ID in order to access the internet at all by going through the internet service provider. Again, you know, uh, there's only a handful of those. That industry is also pretty centralized. And so, you know, if yeah. your ability to, you know, access Bitcoin or run a note or anything is dependent on, you know, power and you're yeah. not off grid or whatever, or it's dependent on an ISP and things like that. Yeah. That's definitely something people should uh, consider. And I think, um, you know, from Mark's and my reporting, it's really clear that the powers that be um, that are interested in, you know, uh, financially surveilling us uh, to the greatest extent possible and basically surveilling us, period, uh, to the greatest extent possible, have been thinking about these things for a very long time. And as it relates to Bitcoin, I mean, they've, they've been thinking about it for well over 10 years um, and they put a lot of money uh, into how they're going to uh, make it work for them. And so we need to, again, direct resources to how we're going to make it work for the people if we're going to make it work for the people. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in the case of any sort of controlled demolition, I don't think they want it to happen until they're ready for it to happen. And so, you know, they're going to wait for certain metrics to be met before it kicks off. Yeah. Um, so obviously, you know, like I mentioned earlier, um, with all this stuff around COVID-19, it seems like the economy was in major trouble um, before COVID. And if COVID hadn't happened when it did, we could have had an economic crisis then uh, without the excuse to, you know, basically print trillions of dollars as, you know, this is our response to the lockdown and the pandemic. I mean, like I said, it was happening before and they found a way to make it keep r rattling on <laughs> for a little longer. Uh, but they know they can't do that forever, right? Because it's a mathematical inevitability that eventually the debt catches up with us if something different isn't done. And again, a lot of the solutions I think they're going to propose um, are going to be things that people would not normally accept were it not a time of crisis. Mm -hmm. And so when you have a crisis yeah. and people are really stressed out and scared, um, especially if it has to do with their money mm -hmm. or losing their money or losing their purchasing power, I think you'll see people sign on to things that they normally would not sign on to. So again, I think it's very likely that we're going to see uh, dollar stable coins proliferate 
And I think part of this too is that you know the Fed uh, has essentially said for a few years now that it's uh, it makes the most sense to do stable coins. You have uh, former top people in the CIA saying that stable coins make a lot more sense than a CBDC, and they say that because you know digital dollars, digital dollar stable coins are already here and they're already servicing the debt through their um, you know m mass purchases yeah. of of treasuries, right? And so. <clears throat> Um, you know, if they were to do a CBDC project or something like that, it would take them several years to develop and they'd, they'd be behind a lot of other countries in the world. Whereas if they make the switch um, to dollar stable coins and make that the preferred currency of American consumers, um, then, you know, they sort of avoid those problems that way and still are able to mm -hmm. obtain the surveillability and programmability through these public private partnerships with the private stable coin issuers uh, that they yeah. would have even if it was a <laughs> CBDC, right? So I think, you know, um, to make that switch, they can just be like, well, you know, maybe your dollar in this, uh, maybe these banks failed and you think your money may be gone, but we'll give you the same amount of money that you had in your bank, uh, but in the form of these stable coins or something, mm -hmm. and you can redeem them here. I mean, uh, pretty much most Americans, I think, would do that to not, uh, you know, lose all their money instantly, right? And so I think it, it's likely that we're going to see some sort of situation um, uh, like that, I mean, remember back to the regional banking crisis with Silicon yes. Valley Bank, it seems very likely that a lot more of that is going to happen. Yeah. And I think you could actually look at that crisis, which arguably um, was manufactured uh, and made to happen, and that 2008 was kind of similar in that way. And those were major bank consolidation plays. And I think there's going to be an effort to consolidate the industry the banking industry mm -hmm. even further in the U.S. with the next crisis. And then those banks are going to be like, well, here you go, tokenized deposits, uh, redeem them this way, or stable coins, or, you know, JP Morgan's JPM coin or something like that, transact with that Wells Fargo's working on one. Um, you know, uh, a lot of these, you know, the biggest banks in the U.S., um, have done that and then they'll be able to keep the two-tier banking system in the u.s the way it is now um but frame it as something you know maybe different than it is we're just modernizing this and this is going to prevent these crises from happening again and maybe we'll roll in bitcoin so that the dollar stays strong and you don't have to worry about hyperinflation um and, you know, I think people in, in considering what kind of crisis it is, you know, may really see that as the right solution. But this is And so these types of manufactured crises are something we definitely need to look out for. And well, I want to make sure that you guys are setting up your financial future and educating yourself. So I want to invite all of you guys to my Discord community where we trade, we share insights, and I give you guys access to all of my crypto trades so you can see awesome profits just like what you see right there. I made those trades available to my community, so you guys should join in too. Sign up to Margins, you see my link down below, hit that Discord link, join in there, and I'll see you guys there. Peace out.